Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected.
Our next song is Your Plans for Us. <clears throat>
I was thinking of how well those <coughs> old songs are written. And then the last one, I'm reminded of what, what Jeremiah and his tribe were headed into captivity. God gave him a message. I know my plans for you. My plans are to build you up and not tear you down. Amen. So we can hang on to that. Shall we pray? Father, you come into this place to set aside <clears throat> ourselves for a while, but to bring you to the forefront, to give you the glory and the honor that your existence truly deserves. We lift up this service to you today, Lord. May every word that is spoken bring you glory. May every note that's struck on an instrument echo your majesty. So Lord, we thank you for who you are and that you have made us and we are yours by design. Thank you, God. That's my wife, that she'll come up and lead us in our responsive reading this morning. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You have yes. said to John, and he has borne witness to the truth, that I do not receive testimony from a man, but I say these things that he may be saved. He was the burning and shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light, but I have a greater witness than John's. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. And the Father himself, who sent me, has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his form. But you do not have his word abiding in you, because when he sent, him you do not believe. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me, that you may have life. I cannot receive honor from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe who receive honor from one another, and you do not see the honor that comes from the Almighty God? Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how can you believe my words? Praise God. And good morning to everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I think this morning, I'd like everybody just to picture themselves around the lake. And you're surrounded with God's presence. And he just wants you to receive his delight. Mm -hmm. So this is God's moment. No mind can comprehend the extent of my delight and my joy for my children. When you disappoint yourself and others, I see you trying your best. There is no shame in my love, and I will never demean you or put you down. Thank you, God. Amen. 
I don't ever show up in your life without the delight of you beaming in my eyes. That right there is joy. My cherished one, it doesn't matter where you have succeeded or failed, but nothing can shape my joy over you. Consider the way mothers see their own children. When they fall and hurt themselves, will a good mother not comfort them? Yes. When your children come to you, beaming with pride over their artful masterpieces, will you not shower them with delight and encourage them? And when they mess up, does the restoration of forgiveness not move your heart with compassion? Even more so, my love is purer than the most devoted mothers. I always receive you freely when you come to me, and I am never far from you. I delight in what delights you, because I love you with the full heart. So today, let any hesitation in your heart melt away as you receive my pure pleasure over you. In Psalm 40, verse 5, it states, O Lord, our God, no one can compare with you. Such wonderful works and miracles are all found with you. And you think of us all the time with your countless expressions of love far exceeding our expectations. So this is the God moment and receive his delight. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Isn't it great that we serve that kind of a God Absolutely. that loves us so deeply and so wonderfully? Turn in your Bibles with me this morning. We're going to be in the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah, chapter 48. And as you're looking for that, again, it's just so awesome that we have a God that loves us so much. But as a result of that, it should be easy to allow us to allow him to lead, shouldn't it? To want to follow him, to, to want to walk in his footsteps. That's not all really nice, isn't it? As long as he's leading on nice green paths that don't have a lot of hills and a lot of rocks, <laughs> or a lot of gullies or quicksand or something of that nature, right? When we know where it is that we're going, when the weather's nice, sun is shining, and the temperature's higher than 20 something degrees, right? <laughs> But how about when God leads in those other moments? How about when God's wanting to lead us in the blizzard? When he's wanting to lead us through rocky soil? When he's wanting to lead us along paths that are muddy as we will experience in just a couple more months, right? We have a tendency at those times to look at God and just have a Desire to say, God, I want to follow you, but isn't there a better way? Can't we go this direction? Or can't we go that way? It would be so much prettier. It would be so much easier. And in a sense, by so asking such things, are we really allowing the Lord to lead? Or are we trying to do the leading? Last time we want to follow God as long as he's going where we want to go. <laughs> but when he wants to go in a different way, it can be a little more difficult. I had a great message last week from, from Linda mm -hmm. about the importance of commitment versus just making a resolution. And really setting our hearts as well as our minds to the things of God. But you know what? Involved in that means letting him lead wherever he wants to lead. Whenever he wants to lead. And to stop when he says stop. 
and to keep going when you feel like you can't keep going. But he says, you must keep moving. Will we let him lead at those times? So I think that's a big piece of where God's going to be taking us in this coming year. Is this understanding that he wants to take us as a church body. And not even just us as a church body. I think he wants to take the church in America a very specific direction. I think he wants to take the church worldwide in a very specific direction. The question is, will we let him? Or will we only let him as long as it looks the way we want it to look? There's been a lot of things spoken within our own congregation through people's times when they've been in prayer amongst our leadership, as well as those in Christendom altogether. They're saying they sense that there's something that's going to be very different about 2023 in a good way as far as what it is God's going to be doing, what God is going to be up to. The question is, and, and our first net attitude is, good, God's going to do something new, amen, but watch out. <laughs> Because that may look great, it may not. But can I tell you this, no matter what it looks like, it is great. Because it's where God is. I don't know what 2023 has in store. I don't even know what this afternoon has in store. How about the rest of you guys? Is any of us really guaranteed tomorrow? Are we guaranteed our next breath? We have to live in a place of full dependency upon God. And a full commitment to what it is that he's up to. And that means being committed even when it's hard. But can I tell you, we need to understand what Sharon just read to us. That we have a God that truly loves us. That wants the best for us. That wants to move in our lives in a wonderful way question is, will we let him, even when it doesn't seem to us to look wonderful? I know that if he was here right now, in fact, he already told me I could talk about this stuff, so I'm going to. But if Paul was here right now, he'd tell you this last week was not all of what he hoped it would have been. Nor is it even now, even now that the surgery is done, when you have to have your head in a contraption, when with your head totally bowed low for 50 minutes out of every hour. It's not easy, but you know what? He has sent God close to him the entire time. Why did he walk the walk? Why was he willing to go? Well, number one, he wanted his eyesight. But any of you who talked with Paul, because you heard him say this even last week, I don't know what God's up to with this, but I'm anticipating he's going to do something through this. And he's going to do something to magnify his own name. He's going to do something to testify of himself through this. I don't know if it's to my family. I don't know if it's to the doctors and nurses. But I know this much. God will magnify himself. And to Paul, that's enough. Can I ask you, is it enough for you? Is it enough for me? Let's look at Isaiah 48. Starting verse 12, it says this. Listen to me, O Jacob, and Israel, my call. I am he. I am the first. I am also the last. So who's talking here? God is, right? <coughs> Indeed, my hand has laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand has stretched out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand up together. All of you, assemble yourselves in fear. Who among them has declared these things? The Lord loves him. He shall do his pleasure on Babylon, and his arm shall be against the Chaldeans. I, even I, have spoken. Yes, I have called him. I have brought him, and his way will prosper. Come near to me, hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, I was there, and now the Lord God and his Spirit have sent me. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord your God, who teaches you to profit, who leads you by the way you should go. Oh, that you had heeded my commandments. Then your peace would have been like a river, and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Lord, as we look at this passage, would you speak? Would people not hear anything that I've got to say, Lord? May we each hear what it is your Holy Spirit wants to say to us, for ourselves, as we 
move forward in your spirit, in your presence, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So he starts right off there establishing his right to say what he is about to say. Notice he says there, verses 12 and 13, he said, listen to me. So notice that, number one, is a command. That's right. Now, hey, if you've got a moment, would you mind kind of coming over here and give me half an ear? Pretend to listen. Use selective listening, whatever the case is. No, he said, listen to me. Who does he want to have listen? Oh, Jacob and Israel. And then he specifies why Jacob and Israel. Why? Because they're my call. Now, how many of you are Jacob and Israel? Not many of us. But how many of us are called by God? Every one of us, if you profess the name of Jesus Christ. Right? So, understand this. What he is about to say is being spoken to you. Not just to Israel. So, this very command that he gives Jacob and Israel is actually a command he gives to you and to me. Listen. Why Listen. Because God just likes to flap his jaw? No. Because whenever God speaks, when he tells you to listen, there's something vital in it for you to be able to live the life he wants you to live. And to be able to step into the fullness of what he wants you to step into. So listen to me, my call. I am he. Who is he? I am the first and I am the last. Have you heard this phrase before? It is spoken loudly in the book of Revelation a number of times in the first couple of chapters. I am the first, I am the last. I was before the beginning of time, before anything ever was, I am. Not I was. I am. But yet he also says, I am the God who was, who is, and who is to come. Right? But I am the first, I am also the last. So when everything else is said and done, I still stand. When everything else crumbles, I will still be there. When all of those that think they have power and might, that think that their existence and their prestige will last for generations, when they have come and when they have gone and they are no more, guess what? I will still be. So listen to me because I am never changing. I will always be there for you. And I will always be the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then he goes on to, to elaborate on that by saying, indeed, right? So in other words, make no mistake about this. Listen to me. I don't want you to miss this. I have laid the foundations of the earth. I have created all things. I have got such incredible power and authority to govern worlds. So let me ask you this. If he has that kind of authority, why do we have such a hard time letting him lead our lives? If he can lay the foundations of the earth, then what have we got to fear about the directions he wants to lead, whether it be here, whether it be there? So he says, indeed, my hand has actually laid the foundations of the earth, and my right hand has stretched out the heavens. And when I call to them, they stand up together in unity. I speak, they respond. All of creation responds at the very sound of my voice. This is who I am. I always was. I always will be. Nothing exists apart from me. Everything has to obey my voice. So all of you, verse 14, Assemble yourselves and hear. In other words, listen to me. <laughs> in, case, in case you've forgotten, in fact, you're only listening to that little piece. I want you to hear this part too, he's saying. Who among them has declared these things? The Lord loves him. Here's a God who governs all things. A God whose power is second to none. A God who could Squash us with the very words from his lips. Tells us this. He loves me. Not only can he govern all things, not only does he have power over all things, 
He loves me. He is passionate for me. And he shall do his pleasure on Babylon, and his arm shall be against the Chaldeans. He loves you, but also understand those that are against his people are against him. And he will seek his own vengeance. That's his place, not ours. Amen? Amen. Amen. This is the God that we serve. A God with so much power, but yet so much love that he would even care about some little speck of dust like me. Because we are, we're filth, aren't we? We were created from dirt. <laughs> but then sin came in and really made us dirty. But yet, he loves us. And then verse 15, he goes on to say this. I, even I. So, so can you hear the passion in his voice? It's, I want you to listen to me. I want you to hear me. Please don't miss a single thing. And now here he's saying, not just I have spoken, he said I. Yes, even I. The, the, the one who really probably shouldn't give you the time of day. But you know what? I love you, and, and I care. And yes, I've called him, I've brought him, and his way will prosper. Now, do not mishear this. This is not some prosperity gospel. Follow God and everything is just going to fall into place for you. How many know sometimes junk happens? Yeah. Even to the believer. God promised us that that would be the case. That's not what's being said here. What it's being said here is that he will prosper you according to his plan, according to his purpose. God, who is before all things, who has created all things, also, by the way, means he created you. And when he created you, just like any artist, just like any sculptor, before they create, they already see the creation in the thing that they are about to create it from. Even though that thing looks very empty if it's a canvas, or a piece of rock that just looks very jagged before it becomes a, a masterpiece. They see the creation before it comes into existence. That's the way it is with you. That's the way it is with me. And God, this God of the universe, yes, even Him, when he created you and he created me, he had a very distinct purpose in mind. And guess what? There's a reason he created you today. Well, not today, but in this lifetime. <laughs> because you've been created much like Esther for such a time as this. Amen. God placed you in this generation, not the generation past, not the generation yet to come. He placed you in this specific generation with your very distinct qualities and characteristics because there's something he wants to do in and through you that is going to touch the masses. Because God is, as it tells us down all the way down in verse uh, 17, he is our redeemer. It is his character to redeem that which has been lost, that which has been stolen from him. And his desire is to take it back. And guess what? He took you back, but not just for you. So you could go out and proclaim his name so even more can be taken back for his glory. <coughs> this God has called you and has brought you into this world. And your way will prosper if you choose to follow him. But here's the key, verse 16. Come near to me. Come near to me. It's not just about, okay, God, I want you to prosper me. Come do what it is you want to do over me because I want to look good in the eyes of other people. It's not about you looking good. It's not about you getting any kind of credit or prestige through this. God's ultimate desire is to prosper you, but the only way you're going to prosper is if you first come near to him. It's about being in close relationship with him. It's not about the very things you're going to do. If you think it's about what you can do for God, you've missed the whole point. Amen. It's Amen. about who God wants you to be in his presence. Whether you ever did a single thing for him or not is not the point. He created you. Why? For the same reason he created Adam and Eve. He wanted relationship. 
They were not, as we've said before, they were not created for worship. He had all the worship coming from the angels already. He did not need more worship, though he desire us, desires us to worship him. He created us for something he could not get from the angels, and that was a true relationship built on a choice of the will. So what he's saying is, look, here's who I am. I am the God. I am the creator of all things. And I love you. I love you so deeply. And I've brought you into this world to do things through you so that I can prosper you in the ways I desire to. But here's what I need from you. Come near to me. Get close to me. Don't be satisfied being where you are. Because no matter where you're at, no matter how long you've walked with the Lord, there's always room to get closer. You can never get too close to God. But too many times I think what happens with us as believers is we can get to this place where we become comfortable. Where we become okay with where things are. Or that old wonderful New England terminology where we feel we're all set. I do my devotions, I go to church every Sunday, I give it the offering, and I worship God, and every time I come, He just comes, and He's with me, and I'm with Him, and we just, you know, it's just all just a wonderful little party. That's nice, but that's not a relationship. No. Come near. Never be happy. Be, sad. be content, but never be satisfied with where you are. Come near to me. And then he says this, hear this. Third time, this, this little uh, short passage of scripture, we're hearing this aspect of listening. And then he says this, I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From, that, from the time that it was, I was there. I have revealed myself, I have made myself known, and now the Lord God and His Spirit have sent me. Christ has been sent. And why was Christ sent? Besides to be the forgiveness of our sins. Though that was enough. He was sent so that he could show us that to live a holy life was possible. And not only to live a holy life, but to live a powerful life of ministry. But not only that, but to also understand the kind of relationship he had with the Father. Because through everything he did, everything he said, what you hear, the resounding reverberation of this concept, as the Father has sent me. The Father has sent me. And now as he sent me, guess what? I'm now going to send you. But my prayer, Father, John 17, right, is that they be one, just as you and I are one. But that they would also be one with us. You know, there, there's this, this constant talk of relationship, the sense of drawing so near that there is a oneness between us and the Father. Let me ask you this, and don't answer out loud. Do you feel, if you're really honest with yourself, that you've achieved that oneness yet? I don't think I have. I, 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 look, I, I hope, and I, and I look at my life, and I think I'm, I'm closer than I was yesterday. I don't think I'm there yet. But I want to be. How about you? And I'm not going to stop until I get there. Truth is, I won't ever get there until I'm with him in heaven. That could keep me from pressing in, though. Then look at verse 17 and 8. Verse 17. So thus says the Lord, which is who? Your Redeemer. The Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord, your God. <clears throat> Two points there. I am the Lord, and I am your God. I have the right to speak into and over your life. I have the right to lead you. I have the right to guide you. And you know what? You can trust it. Why? Because I teach you to profit. Now, this is not a get-rich-quick sermon. <laughs> right? But what is he talking about? I, have, I am the one who teaches you how to excel in everything that I have created you to become and everything I have created you for, for this very point in time, for this very moment. And, and sometimes will that manifest maybe through finances or things like that? It could, but we cannot 
reduce this to that. It is so much more than that. I teach you how to be blessed. And how are you blessed? By drawing near to Him. Draw near to me and I will what? Draw near to you. Heaven comes to us. And guess what? He also leads you by the way you should go. Not just the way He wants you to go, it's the way you should go. Why? Because He created you for a specific path. So here's the key. Oh, that you would heed my commandments. Now notice what came first here. So there's, there's three commands He's really given us in this. Number one, listen. The second thing was what? Come near to me. And now He says that you would heed my commandments. Do not get that out of order. It's not about following His commandments more than it is about drawing near to Him. Because if you follow commandments but you don't draw near to Him, what, do you, what have you got? Religion. You don't have a relationship at all. All you've got is some sort of religion, Christianity or otherwise. What He says is this verse, come near to me. And by the way, as you come near to me, Heed my commandments. Right? In fact, Jesus said this, if you remember, when he was asked what was the greatest commandment, what did he say? He said, the first is what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he said what? On this hinges all the law and the prophets. On this hinges the commandments. That I'm calling you to. So if you get the first part down, the second part will naturally come into play. The problem was the people were not coming near to him. That's why he had to offer the command, come near to me. Why did he say that? Because they were afar off. Come near, come close, and heed my commandments. Heed what it is that I'm going to speak in your ears. Don't just be satisfied drawing close to me and then ignore what it is I want to share with you or say to you. And why is it so crucial that you listen to my commandments? It's not so that I can rain on your parade. It's not so I can dictate things to you. It's this, that your peace can be like a river. How many here would like to be at peace? And I'm not talking about home, <laughs> right? I'm talking about the peace that no matter what's going on around you, you're steadfast, you're secure, you're stable, you feel like your feet are on a rock. Things don't sway you. If you come near to Him and heed His commandments, your peace will be like a river and what? Your righteousness, your ability to live the way He wants you to, will be like the waves of the sea. Do we understand that to let the Lord lead is not some sort of ball and chain for us? It is not that somehow now I'm not going to, I'm going to be restricted in some way in the way I live my life. No, you'll actually be more free than you've ever been in your entire life when you let Him lead. But the thing is, do we trust who He is? Do we trust the fact that He is the Lord of all creation, that He does hold all authority and all power? Because if He does, and we really believe that, then what? Is it really such a big deal the places He wants to tell me to go or where it is He wants me to be? Even if it might be a little uncomfortable for me. Even if it be a lot uncomfortable. <laughs> even if it be downright painful for me. Do I still trust His power? Or do we think that somehow or another he used it up when he created the world? He doesn't use himself up. That same power is available today. But do we understand he has it? And also, do we understand that he truly loves us? Because you have to understand both of those things in order to live a life full of commitment to be willing to go and do the things that he wants you to do. It's not just understanding his power, it's understanding the love in which his power mm -hmm. operates mm -hmm. that will allow us then to move freely <coughs> and with all kinds of peace and actual anticipation for the things that he's going to do. Even when we look at something and it doesn't look like it's green grass, it looks like a mud puddle. Mm -hmm. That it still causes us to say, but God, I know you wouldn't take me there if you weren't going to get me through it. And I know you wouldn't take me there unless you loved me. And unless it had something to do with the way you want to show your love to some other people. So God, let's do this. 
It's a real partnership with God, but we've got to understand that to let God lead first starts with understanding His power and His love, and then being willing to draw near to Him and actually follow what it is He tells us to do. Amen. 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 If we do that, can you imagine where God will take this church in 2023? Mm -hmm. But you know what? It's not enough just for the pastor to do it. And it's not enough for just the leadership to do it. We need to understand we are one body. And it's up to all of us to do this and to walk it out. Amen? Amen. Amen. Lord God, thank you. We thank you that your love is above all. That, that we can't even begin to wrap our heads around how high, how deep, and how wide your love is. And the fact that, God, that you are forever past to forever future. And that, God, we know that you are steadfast and true and faithful in all things. God, help us as we go forward into this year to live our lives as though you are actually the God that is in our Bible and that you truly have not changed. For, Lord, you have not. And so, Lord God, we give ourselves to you to use however you want to use us this year. So come and have your way in us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Very important message, Pastor Taylor. Yeah. So, do we have folks that want to let the Lord guide them this year? Yeah. Let's be joyous in allowing Him to guide us and give Him praise for that. Our last song is, Oh, That the Lord Would Guide My Ways. <clears throat>